today we're just so excited to come together as your sons and daughters to just worship you lord we're here to glorify your name we're here to worship you lord and we pray lord that you may move among us lord and that you may touch us oh god this is the day that you've made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it church let's bless the lord together let's shout shout of praise to him this morning what a beautiful day it is. We're so excited to come together and just worship the King of Kings. Let me just remind you that we do have our communion elements across the sanctuary and of course the rooftop and balcony. If you just want to take your family, please take your family, break the bread together and let's just pray together. That's what God wants of us. He's saying whenever we find time, let's do that as often as we could. We are blessed at Pottersville Church because we do have that platform. So let's use that. Also, if the Lord gives you a word this morning, do share with Paulette, Pastor Kurt, so we all get to hear what the Lord is saying. Together, let's bless the Lord with a clap of hands and a shout of praise. And let's just worship.
available in this place. Thank you, Lord, that you break every limitation. Thank you, Lord, that you change us. By your grace, O oh God, you overrule every lie that the enemy has spoken about us. Thank you that every accusation brought before you by the enemy is overruled this morning because, Father, your word for us is standard and your word is final. Thank you, Jesus, that today we are who you say that we are and we are becoming that which you said we will become. And there's no limitation because the mouth that does not speak no lie has spoken. And Father, we receive your grace this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And I thank you, Father, that every sin and every dent and every spot in our life, every wrinkle is wiped away, every condemnation is taken away, and you set us free and you present us before the Father as your children. We thank you, Lord. And we give you praise.
thank you, Jesus, that your name is powerful, God. Thank you that we can come to your presence, Lord. Washed away, our sins washed us, and we are as white as snow, Jesus. Thank you for who you are to us. Thank you that when we lack, you are full of God. Thank you for our identity, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of our salvation. Meet with us, O oh Heavenly Father. We know that you have an appointment with us this morning, O oh Heavenly Father. Speak to each and every one of us in a very special way. We thank you for who you are, Jesus. Amen. Saints, in this really wonderful atmosphere of worship, I would like to invite you at this time, if you will just bring your tithes and offerings as an act of worship and just lay that down before the Lord. But also while we're doing that, I want you to just know that we had the most incredible day yesterday as we celebrated the graduation of students from the Men's Center and the Women's Center. We heard powerful testimonies of incredible life change that really just left us breathless in a sense. And we thank God for His powerful Word and the way that He works in our hearts and in our lives. And with that in mind, I pray that you'll just come forward and as you Enact your worship that you will bring the tithes and offerings and God bless you. Benny Women Center, embracing women from all walks of life, has welcomed women to a lifestyle modeled by Christ, providing spiritual, emotional and physical healing to women who have faced various challenges in their lives. Our center works to make a difference in women's lives by giving holistic care and support to women by showing God's love and compassion. In this program, women are exposed to various activities and learning opportunities specifically designed to equip, empower, and educate them. Some of these activities include, but are not limited to, entrepreneurship through the production and sale of cleaning products, such as floor polish and dishwashing soap, basic computer skills, gardening, sewing, cooking, and cleaning. More importantly, our women are exposed to a life of daily Bible devotions, intense Bible study, pastoral counseling, and extra lessons to help them on their journey of continued spiritual and mental growth. Join in with Challenge Ministries as we celebrate what God has done in the lives of these women through kingdom transformation, one life at a time. And I would like to thank you so very much for being a part of the transformation that is taking place at the Women's Center. The contributions that we give goes towards making that incredible change, that difference. And as we celebrate that, as we enjoy that, know that we're part of a church that makes a difference and that we're part of the kingdom of God as God brings His kingdom down to earth. There are some other things that we do that are also equally important. We want to celebrate our Timothys. So on the 16th and the 17th of December, we'd like to bring them in here and have, just have a time of closeness and fellowship for that Timothy's camp. So if you do have Timothy's, please do make sure that they register. The Timothy's are the group who are leaving primary school and getting ready for high school. We also, at the same time, we have a youth camp here at, at the Pottersville Church. We're going to spend the nights together with the youth and it's also a time of fellowship to have them solidify the teachings of the year and just celebrate what God has done throughout the year. We continue to remember the people in the center, the men's center and the women's center. We also have children that we've taken into our care here at Hawani and also in Bulembu. And we want this season, this festive season, to be a joyous occasion for them. So we invite you to just bring a gift for either for the children or for the students who are in the center, please don't wrap it so that we can make sure that when we do pass the gift on that it is gender appropriate and also age appropriate. So if you'll bring it to the reception area, we will then take the time to wrap it and send it up to the centers. And I want to thank you for the times in the past where you have made that difference in the lives of the people that we walk through life with. So thank you for your generosity uh, as we bring a gift and we bring a smile. We will continue to meet as life groups. 
And so on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., we invite those of you who are not part of a life group that meets in somebody's home to please feel free, come and join us here at Potter's Wheel as we spend that time of just delving deeper into the word that we've received and, and making it as meaningful as we can as we go through questions and answers and, and as we pray for each other in that time. So please join us Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. And then also today after the second service, we're going to have a baptism ceremony. We've got a number of people who are going to be baptized and we really uh, invite you if you would like to be a part of that and just in, uh, be a part of the joy that goes together with seeing people being buried with Jesus, join us at that time. Can I ask at this time that we give a really warm welcome to Pastor Kevin as he comes forward. Our loving Father, we just praise and honor you. We thank you for Pastor Kevin, for his leadership, for the way that he teaches, and Father, for the way that he's able to bring your word and put it in our hearts to make a difference in our lives. We pray, Lord, that today your anointing be on him. I pray, Father, that we have receptive hearts and minds. Lord, that we'll be able to retain this and that we can receive the blessing that comes through a closer understanding of who you are. Thank you for your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isn't it great to be able to worship together and to be able to get into the Word? Thank you so much for being the family, the church that you are. To see your support for the Women's Center, for the Men's Center is amazing. So thank you so much. What a breakthrough for the centers. Please pray for them as they take this next step out of the center into the next phase of their lives as they graduate and take a step out. We trust the Lord will allow them to bear fruit that honors His name. This morning, I want to pick up from where Pastor Stan was. He did an amazing service. If you missed his service called No Pain, No Gain, can I ask you to listen to it? Because it is absolutely phenomenal. And within that, he talks about how sometimes pain comes because we live in a fallen world with fallen angels and a very real devil as well as fallen men. Uh, can I ask you just to turn to your neighbor and say, please forgive me, I have issues. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because, you know, aside from the fallen world, there's us too. We're also fallen. We're far from perfect. All have fallen short of the glory of God, except Jesus. Amen? And uh, as I share that, you know, we're in a season, today is possibly one of the most important sermons for the season that we're in than I have shared. And it's the last one of the series of the Crucible series. And as I share that, I really believe it's important for us to recognize that we're living in a dangerous time. And uh, the scripture warns us, 2 Timothy chapter 3 warns us, how we're living in a dangerous, perilous times at these end times where will be a time when men will be lovers of money, lovers of themselves, that they will be blasphemous, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, that they will be slanderous, without self-control, brutal, traitors, despisers of good, headstrong, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power of God, denying the Holy Spirit to convict and to change them. So we live in a time that's dangerous, where there's a fallen planet, fallen angels, a very real devil, and fallen man. And then at this time, there's this spirit of lawlessness that covers the whole earth. And this lawlessness that covers the earth appeals to our flesh. And unless we know how to fight back, you'll find that your flesh is pulled into that lawlessness. You'll find your flesh is drawn into, tempted, and deceived into a fight that God hasn't called you to fight. So how do I fight back? How to fight back is today's Message, how do we fight back God's way? Because with all the pain and the lawlessness that has increased around the world, 
Satan really does want you and I to wallow in a sea of self-pity, a sea of unforgiveness, a sea of bitterness, where we are angry, permanently offended, permanently disappointed, and we are almost at a place of being cynical. When something good comes, you find us responding, can anything good come out of that family? Can anything good come out of that person? Can anything good come out of that situation? Cynical. God warns us in the book of Jeremiah, he says that the place that people get to when they're in this lawlessness is they will not even see the good when the good comes. You see, Satan wants us to give up, to lie down, and to live in a constant spiritual, emotional, physical pain. Because Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. When you see theft, killing, and destruction, please understand, that is the fruit of the devil himself. Can you say with me, Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. It's important to recognize that because there is a way to fight back. The problem is our flesh wants to fight through the flesh, whereas God has called us to fight in the spirit. And if we fight in the flesh, you sow to the flesh, and if you sow to the flesh, you reap destruction, but if you sow to the spirit, you reap eternal life. The Lord led me to the book of Judges chapter 6 to try and show us as a family this, how to fight back. And uh, in Judges 6 is the story that's very well known about Gideon, where Gideon is in a wine press, hiding from the enemy called the Midianites, and the Midianites have come in and dispossessed Israel of the land, and they have taken the crops and the herds and stolen the businesses and burnt everything to the ground. And, and, and now Israel has nothing so little that Gideon himself, any fruit that he has, any crops that he has, he, he takes it and he hides it in the wine press. And you see, a wine press at that time was uh, in a building and it had a hole in the ground that, that, that they would put the grapes into the hole of the ground you can see this old architect, architectural drawings and you can see how the walls would have been up in the hole in the middle, well below the window. Now what happened is Gideon, he, he went and took that wheat and he, and he put it into this hole in the ground which would have been filled with dirt. And he, and he was threshing the wheat, hiding from the Midianites because he was scared that the Midianites would see his wheat and steal it from him. At this time, in Judges chapter 6, we see that God warns that the situation is, is severe for him. Where, where what's happened in verse 4, you can see how the Midianites have stolen. Look at this in verse 4. Judges chapter 6 verse 4. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. They left nothing. For the Midianites would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as the locusts, both they and the camels were without number. And they would enter the land and they would destroy it. So Gideon is really discouraged. And please understand the tactic of the devil is to get us to a place of being distracted, discouraged, in order to bring doubt and to divide us. And in this place of discouragement, threshing the wheat, choking with all the dust, hiding below the windowsill, God is still with him. In fact, the angel of the Lord comes underneath the terebinth tree and starts to speak to Gideon. And I want to put it to you this morning, no matter how distracted, discouraged, no matter how much you're doubting, maybe you're in the hole in the ground, you feel trapped. 
Maybe you're in a hole of debt or maybe you're in a hole of emotional trauma. And you're in this hole and maybe you're choking on the dust of the situation that you're in. And you feel maybe abandoned and alone, but let me tell you, God is with you. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Gideon was in that place, and yet God was there. The angel of the Lord was there. The truth of the situation is the Mennonites had besieged the land, burned the businesses to the ground. There was destruction all around them. And it was Satan's work. Yet, God was with him. If you could go to Judges chapter 6, and I accidentally opened to the book of Joshua, Judges chapter 6, you'll see the scripture says in verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat underneath the terebinth tree, which was an opera, which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Mennonites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon didn't feel like a mighty man of valor. Gideon didn't look like a mighty man of valor. Gideon had lost his business, lost the fruit. All he had was this wheat and he had a very real enemy. You might not feel like a mighty man of valor this morning. You might not, in your mind, look like a mighty man of valor. And Satan might be oppressing the situation you're in, saying, this is a losing situation, you're on your way out, this is a disaster. He might be oppressing you just as he did with Gideon. You might even be in the place that Gideon was where God says, you're a mighty man of valor. And so Gideon's reaction is, if I'm a mighty man of valor, why has this happened to us? Where are all the miracles that God spoke of through our fathers? If God is with us, why are there not these miracles? And now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Maybe right now that's how you feel. Maybe you feel as Gideon did. Because our first reaction is always in the flesh. And the flesh is going by how we feel, by what we see, by what we hear, and not by what the Spirit of the Lord is telling us. Gideon was in the flesh, feeling rejected, abandoned, feeling like there weren't the miracles, asking God, where are your miracles? Maybe that's where you are now. The problem with speaking and complaining is that when we complain, we open a door to, to destruction. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 10 says, Don't complain and moan and groan as they did, lest you open the door to the angel of destruction. God would have us this morning recognize that His Word is the absolute authority. Let me say over you this morning, I believe God says to you, You're a mighty man, mighty woman of valor. God has called you, God has appointed you, and God has blessed you with favor. Can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, mighty man or mighty woman of valor? <laughs> you see, to fight back God's way, we need to recognize who our real enemy is. We need to know what to fight, how to fight, if you're fighting with the flesh, you'll be fighting flesh instead of fighting in the spirit. Even though Gideon is hiding out of a spirit of fear, even though Gideon is in the wrong place emotionally, spiritually, and even physically, the reality is God is still with him and God is still with you. You see, love never gives up. God never gives up on you. He's knocking on the door of your heart. The scripture says the calling of God on Gideon's life and on your life is irrevocable. He never lifts it. The gifts of the spirit that he's placed in your life, that he placed in Gideon's life, is irrevocable. He never takes it away. The calling 
and the gifts are irrevocable. Now fight back. Fight back. But fight, first, your first fight is against deception. Fight against deception. Can I ask you to nudge your neighbor and say, fight against deception? You see, your real enemy isn't a person. It's easy to make the Mennonites your enemy. It's easy to make flesh and blood your enemy. But your enemy isn't a person. It is a spirit who comes to flood our thoughts and give us information to distract, to discourage, to divide, and to bring doubt. The scripture warns us the battle is very real. Deception is real. It's a real spiritual war. It's very real. The scripture tells us in Ephesians that our battle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. But Satan would love you to make your battle with flesh and blood. God says your battle isn't with flesh and blood. Satan wants you to fight flesh and blood. That guy is the problem. That man, that person, that woman, that's the problem. Satan wants you to make that person the problem when in fact your battle isn't with flesh and blood. Satan would love you to make the problem your spouse because he wants to break hearts. Satan would love you to make the person your employer because he'd love to bring division. Satan would love you to think it's a person in your life and you get so offended with that person because you're missing the target. The Mennonites were a manifestation of just that. It was a real war, a people being used by a spirit, a demonic spirit, to steal, kill, and destroy, coming in to attack and destroy Gideon's family. The scripture tells us in the New Testament, 1 Peter 5 verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, <laughs> just note that please, your adversary is the devil, not a person, the devil. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So family, the season we're in now, is not a season where you should wake up in the morning and allow your feelings to shape your choices for the day. This is not a season to wake up and roll up and roll out of bed and feel frustrated with a person and allow those frustrations to continue to lead you. Because the battle is real and the battle is over lies. The battle is over lies. Satan is the father of lies. He speaks lies. He floods thoughts, lies into our mind to deceive us in order to draw us into temptation. Because if he can get us to believe the deception, he'll draw us into temptation in order to get us to a place where he can condemn us through accusation. Satan twists and turns the lies to use the lies to deceive us. With Eve, he twisted God's truths. With Jesus, he tried to twist the truth as well. He said to Jesus, turn this stone into bread. He said to Jesus, jump from this top place and throw yourself down to the earth and prove that you're God. He said to Jesus, you can have all these kingdoms if you'll just worship me. See, Satan comes to give us something that's a lie, and he says something like this. All God wants you to do is to be happy. Be happy. Everyone else is doing it. Why can't you do it? Just be happy. God wants you to be happy, so it's okay if you do that. He's a liar. In John 8 verse 44, he says, Jesus speaks and he says, you are of the father, the devil, of your father, the devil, 
and the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and a father of lies. I don't know about you, but I've fallen for some of Satan's lies. Gideon was standing in that place. He had fallen for the lies of the devil. You're not a mighty man of valor. He believed the lie that he's the least in his family, the least of his 12 tribes, that he's the least of the least of the least. Right now, what lies have you fallen for? Because Satan comes with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When Jesus tackled the lies, when he fought the deception, his response was, it is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus, who is the Word, went to the Word of God as absolute authority. If Jesus had to go to the Word to fight Satan, how much more do we need to go to the Word? So can I ask you to consider this? Stop listening to yourself. Stop listening to your feelings. If you're in a war and you're fighting deception, stop listening to yourself. Start listening to God. Turn to the truth, God's word. Fight deception. If you don't recognize Satan's voice, and Satan's voice will come and say, oh, God just wants you to be happy. Of course you can do it. He just wants you to be happy. Everyone else is doing it, so why can't you? Listen to Proverbs, the word of God. Proverbs 7, verse 21. With her enticing speech... She caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him in. Immediately he went after her as an ox to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks until an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. Deception is real. We're living in a time where lawlessness increases and deception increases. First, fight deception. Second, fight against temptation. Because that speech is enticing to draw that person into that. Satan comes to stir our imagination, to get us to yield our flesh. That's what Gideon is doing as he threshes the wheat. He's even in a place of mocking God. If God is, he's talking to God. If God is for us, and if God is with us, and God is right there, then where are the miracles? Satan is trying to get Gideon to act in his flesh, to allow Gideon to be shaped by fear and the culture around him. And that's why he's in that place of saying, I'm the least of the least of the least. I'm the least in my family, the least in the 12 tribes. I'm the least. And yet the Lord is saying, I am with you. I am for you. I'm not against you. The Lord is trying to draw us into the presence of God and allow us to enjoy the benefits of the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do you fight Satan's temptation? Speak God's word over your soul. Speak God's word over your soul. God was standing there and he was speaking over Gideon's soul. You are a mighty man of valor. I am with you. I am for you. Even as Gideon is being tempted to follow his flesh, his response to Satan's temptation was, Jesus' response to Satan's temptation was, remember, it's written, it's written, it's written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's Jesus saying. He's resting on the word from, from, Jesus, from the Lord. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It is written, you shall not, 
You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Jesus quotes the Word of God as absolute authority. Not the world's reality, but God's authority. Don't just read the Word of God. Speak out the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Gideon hears the angel of the Lord, which I believe is Jesus, speaking over him, you mighty man of valor. God would have us speak out his promises and his word over ourselves and over our soul. That's his plan. Speak his word out. Speak his word out over your family. Pray his word out over your family. Pray his word out over your, your spouse. Bless the children. Speak it out because there's a real battle for your soul going on. Satan wants to flood you your thoughts to impact your soul. You know, in FFI, and I would encourage anyone who can go on Ancient Paths, Ancient Paths to attend Ancient Paths if you can, they have an amazing seminar in FFI. But in the seminar, they have this drawing, which I think is a very good one. It's three rooms. Just look at this drawing of three rooms, where we're made out of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit, when we receive Christ, is a new creation. But we still have our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions that we need to bring in submission to the Lord. And then we still have our flesh, our memories, our past. And the problem is our soul can only have a door open to one voice at a time. We're either listening to our flesh, in which case the fruit of our life will be flesh, or we, we close the door to the flesh and we open the door to the Spirit and we receive from the Spirit of God. But you can't have your door open to the flesh and Spirit at the same time. I, remember when Peter is with Jesus and Jesus says, Who do men say I am? And Peter says, You are the Son of God, the Most High. And Jesus says to Peter, the Father has told you that. He'd received that from the Spirit of God. A couple of minutes later, Jesus explains that he's going to have to die and be resurrected from the dead again. And so Peter says to him, No, Lord, don't do that. And, Peter, and, and Jesus turns around and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Why? Because he'd closed the door to the Spirit and he'd opened the door to the flesh. Let me put it to you like this. When we allow our flesh to speak and shape us, we're allowing Satan to speak to us. And so the fruit of the flesh is evident for all to see. And so James 4 verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God would have us submit to God first, resist the devil through the Spirit of God, and he will flee. But when he flees, please understand, even Jesus, he'd been tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. We see the scripture tell us in Luke that after he's been tempted for these 40 days, Luke 4, 13, the scripture says, Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him, look at this, until a more opportune time. Tell your neighbor, more opportune time. In other words, the devil doesn't give up. He's waiting for an opportune time. He's waiting for you to feel frustrated and he floods you with the frustrations. And unless you fight deception, unless you fight temptation, you'll find yourself being shaped by the flesh instead of by the Spirit. So we need to invite the Holy Spirit in to give us counsel, to guide us, to convict us, to give us the mind of Christ. In 1 John 4, verse 4, the scripture says, You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In other words, the Lord's saying to you today, Holy Spirit is in you, is greater than he who is in the world. You might be in that hole in the wine press with a broken relationship, 
And you might be feeling like a failure. You might be feeling like a loser. It might feel like the business, the relationships are gone. And God is saying, I'm still with you. I'm still for you. You're a mighty man of valor. Let me train you because the Holy Spirit is in you. But Gideon had to admit that he and his family had built an altar to Baal on his property and that the whole family had been seduced and tempted into Baal worship. Even Gideon and his family had been in Baal worship. And so the Lord convicts Gideon and says, you need to face what you've done, pull down that altar of Baal and build up an altar of worship before God. You need to start speaking thanksgiving over yourself. Intentionally speak thanksgiving over our lives. Start speaking the word of God over our lives. Speak it over your children. Speak it out over your family. Speak it out over the business. Hearing the word of God, speak the word of God over us. And as you worship him and praise him, he goes to war for you. And this is what Gideon was learning, is that first pull down this altar, build up the correct altar of worship, in order to fight Satan's accusations. Three wars we've got. Deception, temptation, and once Satan gets us tempted, and in that act he brings the accusations. He brings the accusation that you're not worthy, that you're condemned, that you're a failure, that you're a loser. He says, not only did you do a bad thing, but therefore you are bad. Not only did you lose, but you are a loser. He says, God will never take you back. He says, you've missed the calling. You've missed the opportunity. I've heard people come to me and say, Kevin, you know what? I really messed up. God called me to do this and I never did it. I missed the opportunity. Do you know God never gives up on you? He calls you now to do what he called you to do. The gifts and the calling are irrevocable. God keeps knocking on the door of your heart and he kept knocking on the door of Gideon's heart. The same is true for you today. You are a mighty man of valor, a mighty woman of valor. God has called you. He's not lifted his favor. He's not lifted his gifts. And as I end, I want to show this to you, please. Just watch these scriptures. This was so important for me personally as I walked through my own personal journey of faith. It's found in Zechariah chapter 3, where God is speaking to a pastor, Joshua. And he says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Remember, the angel of the Lord is Jesus. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him, to oppose him. You can imagine that's a bit like Gideon right now. Gideon's in there and Satan's accusing him, but Jesus is still there. Jesus is your advocate. When Satan is accusing you, get your advocate. The way you fight back against accusations is you get your advocate. Tell your neighbor, get your advocate. And your advocate is Jesus. Verse 2 says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not a brand plucked from the fire? The Lord rebukes Satan. But keep this in mind. Joshua's garments are filled with dirt. They are filthy. The word filth in the scripture there refers to feces. In other words, Joshua's garment was filled with feces. And, and the picture is, Joshua the pastor's garment, Joshua's garment, was filled with sin. Look at verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Say with me, filthy. Joshua's garments was filthy garments and was standing before the angel of the Lord. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. Some of you this morning, you might feel like your life is represented by filthy garments. The Lord says, take away the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. 
and I will clothe you with rich robes. I'll give you new robes, the gift of righteousness, the robe of righteousness in Christ. And I said, let them put on a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Family, Jesus is our advocate in this war. You might feel like you're being accused in business, accused in relationships. Jesus is your advocate. And he's saying, receive his righteousness, receive his grace. Right now, I believe across the room, we're in a defining moment in a season that's a season that is testing every one of us. Imagine now that there's this cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. On the one side is the dark condemnation that Satan has accused you with, where maybe he said to you, you are sexually immoral. Maybe he said to you, you are an adulterer. You are sexually broken. Maybe he said to you, you are a failure in business or failure in relationships. Maybe he says to you, you are a disappointment. Maybe you feel like you're a disappointment. Maybe you feel shamed and shameful right now. Maybe you feel worthless because of the mistakes you've made. Because Joshua's garments were filled with filth. Gideon's garments were dirty as he was in that wine press. But Jesus comes along and he says, those aren't the garments I gave you. I'm giving you a new garment. And the new garment is this. Gideon, you're a child of God. You're forgiven. You're blessed. You're strong. You're holy in His sight. You're worthy. You're favored. You're chosen. And I love you. And today, God says that over you. Tell your neighbor, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> but which voice will you listen to today? Are you going to listen to the accuser's voice that says, you're worthless? Are you going to let the deception, the lies shape you to tempt you in order to accuse you? Or are you going to let God take off that dirty garment, that filthy garment, and throw it aside? And let him give you the righteous robe. Whose voice will you listen to? Will you receive the robe of righteousness this morning? Will you receive his righteousness? Gideon did. But I want to end on this point. You're not called to walk this alone. If you're going to fight deception, fight temptation, and fight accusation, you need to pray together. And you need to be accountable. Jesus said, when you pray with one, a thousand are put to flight. When you pray with two, ten thousand are put to flight. Jesus said, if two or more are gathered in my name, what is praised, prayed for will be established and it shall be done. But in praying together, there's a level of accountability, isn't there? It's not just praying together. It's challenging one another to say, hey, your heart seems hard. I remember a time... I was praying, and Asha said to me, Dad, can I speak to you afterwards? Yes, Asha. <laughs> Dad, I just want to say your heart seems hard. And she was right. I had to get on my knees and repent and ask God for forgiveness. Because a hardened heart is not what God has given you. God gives you a soft heart that's moldable, that shapes, that loves, that loves him and loves his neighbor, your neighbor, as much as he loves you. He says, by your love for one another, they shall know that you are my disciples. So as soon as your heart is hard, you need to be accountable. Pray together, but be accountable. Open up. And what that looks like for husbands and wives is that you allow each other to challenge each other. Don't say there, because I'm the father. You, Asher, you can't speak into my life. Don't say there to your wife, because I'm the husband. I'm the man of the house. You can't speak into my life. We are equal before the cross. And God will use your family. God will use your friends to challenge you. But you need friends who know the word of God as absolute authority in your life. Jesus calls us to pray 
Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's finished praying. He's been sweating blood because he's going to face the cross for you and I. He's thinking of the cross, that he's going to the cross to remove the filthy garments, to absorb sin into his body, and he's going to hand out the righteous robe. And he's sweating blood. He stands up. He goes to the disciples who've been sleeping. Maybe many of us have been sleeping in this season. And Scripture says in Luke 22, verse 45, When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow. Have you been sleeping from sorrow in this season? He said to them, why do you sleep? Rise up and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Saints, can I ask you just to close your eyes and invite the worship team up? I believe God is saying it's time to put the boxing gloves on. It's time to fight Satan's deception, fight Satan's temptation, fight Satan's accusation. It's time to pray together, even this morning, to be accountable to one another, accountable to God. As I say that this morning, I believe God wants to sing over us a song. And I'm going to ask Tim Baker to do something unusual, to sing a song over you this morning. Because I, I believe just with your heads bowed, eyes closed, even if you're online right now. If you recognize you've been like Gideon, where your family or you have been involved in some sort of Baal worship you shouldn't have been involved in. You've been deceived, you've been tempted, and now you're being accused. And you find yourself in the hole in the ground, in a hole of debt, a hole of broken relationships. And you hear God's word saying, you mighty man of valor, but you're asking, where are the miracles? Maybe that's you right now. I believe that God wants to remove the robe of filth that's on us. I, let, I had to let God do this. Remove the robe of filth and let Him give you a robe of righteousness. His robe, because He went to the cross Jesus went to the cross and absorbed all that filth. Jesus absorbed that filthy garment. Jesus absorbed our sin into his body. He took our sin to the cross. And he came down from the cross to give you his Holy Spirit. That you today would be able to put on the spiritual boxing gloves. That you would be able to Recognize it's time to fight in the spirit, to fight deception, fight temptation, fight accusation, to pray and be accountable, and to start loving one another. God would have us fight by loving. He said, pray for those who persecute you. Give them food. Give them a drink. In so doing, you heap coals of fire on their head our fight is not a fight of flesh it's a fight in the spirit he calls us to just hear these words you can open your eyes if you want you can have your eyes closed but hear these words sung over you in the spirit today in Jesus name Amen You're an army in His eyes.
you to stand with me this morning. I believe many of us have been carrying garments that are dirty, like Gideon, and hiding in the wine press. And I believe today God would have you allow him to take off that filthy robe and give you his robe of righteousness. I believe today God says in this crucible moment, in this defining moment, this tipping point, he's calling you to fight back. Fight against the deception. Fight against the temptation. Fight against the accusation. God is calling you to hear him by praying and being accountable. He's calling you to go and love just as He loves you. Can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and this morning across this room, if you recognize that you have been like Gideon and, or Joshua and you, you, you've had that filthy robe, the robe of unrighteousness, this robe that's got filth in it and it's, it's shaping you, the fear is shaping you. You're allowing the circumstances and the fear to shape you so that you're hiding in this wine press, threshing wheat, feeling like you're business, the opportunities, the future is burnt. And yet God is standing next to you and says, mighty man of valor, stand up. Come into my presence and receive my robe of righteousness. Receive my promises. Receive my grace. Receive my love. Let me provide for you, he says this morning in Jesus' name. And so if that's you right now, when you recognize that you've got this robe that's been holding you down, can I ask you just to put your hand up before the Lord and say, that's me, that's me, that's me. And as we go into this time of worship, I invite you to come forward and just kneel before the Lord and hand over that disappointment, the robe of disappointment, the robe of false accusations, the robe of believing lies, 
and receive this morning God's robe of righteousness. I believe that we need to prophetically just kneel before God and receive from Him this morning. Some of you might feel this is the time to take Holy Communion and remember that Jesus gave His body for you, shed His blood for you. But now is the time to allow God to fill you with His Spirit. Now is the time to stand up and fight deception, temptation, accusation, and to come into His presence with prayer, being accountable to Him in Jesus' name. He says over you, mighty man and woman of valor, receive my gift of righteousness in Jesus' name. Stop fighting in the flesh and blood. Start fighting in the Spirit. I am with you. I am for you. I will never give up on you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Can I ask you to, as an act of faith, can you say with me, I'm a mighty child of God. A little louder. I'm a mighty child of God. It's important for us to recognize that God has called you. His calling and His gifts will not be taken away. God is standing beside you and He says, you mighty man and woman of valor, God is with you. Fight the fight against deception, temptation and accusation. But stand in the presence of God and receive His robe of righteousness. Can I ask you to put your hand on your shoulder and say with me, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. In Jesus' name. You mighty man of valor. God bless you.